Welcome to this video about the don'ts of Tulumnia care. Based on my experience in my climate, etc., I thought I would bring some things to your attention if you yourself haven't noticed yet, or if you have noticed something odd happening with your Tulumnias, maybe this video will help you identify what the symptoms are that you are seeing based on what I'm going to tell you. There is no real particular order in the don'ts of Tulumnia care. The main thing to take into consideration with everything that I'm going to point out is if your tulumnia is healthy, the majority of what I'm going to tell you won't take your tulumnia down. However, more often than not, we get our tulumnias as a single fan and then good luck with cultivating it to a strong multiple fan orchid. We know the stresses of transportation that can take a tulumnia down even though it has arrived new in your collection and it looks somewhat healthy, but the plant has already been through considerable stress, it arrives as a single fan, hasn't seen light for a long time, comes to a new environment, the acclimating process, etc. It may be that you are losing a tulumnia simply because of the whole transportation and it has nothing to do with your care. So having a healthy tulumnia to begin with, all the don'ts, doesn't mean that your tulumnia is going to go downhill. However, if you have a healthy tulumnia and a combination of some of the don'ts come into effect, that could take a very healthy tulumnia down relatively quickly. But I do want to point out the major threat that I see in my collection when it comes to tulumnia care. We'll start with that right away, and that is a pest attack, specifically scale. You don't even need to have a scale infestation per se. It'll take one adult to then create a serious problem around the tiny structures and the base of the fan that'll knock out a tulumnia. Even if the tulumnia has matured and has been in your collection quite some time, has bloomed several seasons, etc. The moment you get scale in there, that is when problems will really, really start. You have to be on top of that scale infestation like a bonnet on a car. I mean, do not take your eyes off that tulumnia because the scale doesn't necessarily just have to be in the leaf joints. They will also hide within the roots and the media. So the first off treatment, my preferred treatment with garlic and alcohol, takes care of the adults, takes care of the crawlers. That doesn't mean my job is done. I have to maintain vigilance because these guys will show up and start the same problem on another section of the orchid. In 2022, I had a major scale infestation. I took my eye off the ball when they were hanging on the west side of my south-facing portico. I thought they were protected, but the time flew so quickly and two months went straight into four months and that is far too long for any preventative measures to protect the orchids. What I should have done is every two months take my tulumnias down from the trellis and mist them with the garlic alcohol, paint the base of the structures and they would have been protected because of the repelling properties of the garlic. That didn't happen, so scale has decimated part of my Tulumnia collection. I have more than what you see on the table here, but I thought the ones in bloom and in spike looked a little bit prettier. Still, I've already lost a Tulumnia due to scale, and there are two more that aren't looking so good, and they may be on their way out. So just make sure you keep an eye on your Tulumnias and make sure that not a single pest gets a hold anywhere on the plant. It's pretty rare in my climate to see a mealybug on a Tulumnia, but scale are also international and universally <laughs> spread. Watch out for the scale. No matter what you do, no matter how much care you take, it is possible that your tulumnia is history once you see it. The next important one that will take your tulumnia out, at least that happened also in my collection in 2020, that is to over-fertilize. Now, we have to be specific when it comes to what does over-fertilizing mean, depending on the setup. If you're growing your tulumnias in a wet-dry cycle, it is very easy to over fertilize very very quickly because the roots do not have time to absorb the nutrients before the water evaporates and then you get salt burn and with that the fine roots of a tulumnia are history meaning it is the end of that tulumnia unless the conditions are favorable enough it is within the growing season that they can somehow recuperate 
and then start a new structure and grow new roots. So I have two setups. I have the wet dry cycle and I have two tolumnias in semi-hydro. When it comes to semi-hydro, over fertilizing can only be dangerous if you over fertilize beyond what the size of the orchid is. Tolumnias are miniature orchids, so they don't really need much fertilizer. So the fertilizing quantity should be low anyway, but it can be a tad higher than a wet dry cycle setup because the roots are constantly damp. That means that the velamen can't burn out. There is no evaporation on the roots and we can be a little bit more generous with the fertilizer. If you're wondering what I'm talking about when I say over fertilizing, in 2020, I took my tolumnias to town and I fertilized them at 300 parts per million. And in my super dry climate, that was pretty much the nail on the coffin for many of my tolumnias because they couldn't absorb the nutrients by the time the water had already evaporated around the roots. In 2021, I dialed that down to a hundred parts per million and then followed up within 30 minutes with plain RO water to make sure that anything that should evaporate faster won't burn the roots and that has worked successfully. 100 parts per million is absolutely sufficient. For a tolumnia, it doesn't have to be 300 parts per million, which is a crazy figure considering I fertilized my large cattleyas at 300 parts per million. Yeah, don't know what I was thinking there. Well, clearly I wasn't thinking. But you see, the semi-hydro pots, because the roots are constantly damp, I can go up to 150 or 160 parts per million and that is working out beautifully. I don't have any root burn. So when I'm talking about over fertilizing, I'm giving you my margins based on my climate and my lack of humidity, which is a great seg into humidity. Another big factor about the don'ts of Tolumnia care is ignoring the fact that they need a lot of humidity if you're going to apply a higher concentration of fertilizer. If you have enough humidity, the evaporation is not as fast, no matter how hot it is. The higher the humidity, 85% or higher, consistently will avoid premature evaporation of any kind of fertilizer solution around the roots. However, if you're not growing in a wet dry cycle or you don't have your tolumnias mounted, you have them potted up in a semi-hydro setup, the high humidity can work against you because it can pose a problem with regards to rot around the base. Even though an established tolumnia looks pretty, pretty solid and can ward off certain things, there is something about the base of tolumnias that we always need to be mindful of. And that is why scale goes there. The spaces in between the leaf joints, the bracts from the new growth, everything around there is very tight and of course very, very small. So even high humidity will find and get a hold into those tight nooks and crannies and that is where rot will start very, very quickly. And it is super difficult to bring a tolumnia back that has experienced rot at the base of the fan. So match your humidity levels with your setup. A wet dry cycle with high humidity can also be achieved. And then you can be a little bit more generous with the fertilizer, seeing as the evaporation isn't as fast. But watch out with your setup when you have a high humidity environment, even if it is pouring with rain consistently in your wet dry cycle, add the humidity to that, the rot will kick in rather quickly. No matter the airflow, high humidity, lots of airflow is wonderful for many, many orchids. But if you have high humidity consistently, add to that a lot of rain, the airflow is not going to help you. So keep an eye on your tolumnias if you are in that kind of a climate. Low humidity is a problem in my climate. Add to that hot, dry winds and I will get leaf tip burn. That is not fertilizer burn. By the time I had fertilizer burn, it didn't even reach the leaves because the roots were already dead. But low humidity, in contrast, will show you desiccating leaf tips. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the tolumnia, but be aware that your tolumnia is still getting hydrated enough, even if you've got leaf tips that are looking crispy and turning brown. Do not continue watering thinking you're underwatering. That is a result of low humidity in combination with heat. However, that symptom of the leaf tips looking desiccated, shriveling up, 
as I'm going through the don'ts and your mind is drifting towards your Tolumnia collection, if any of the information I'm providing is helpful, please consider giving this video a like. A share would be fabulous and if you haven't subscribed, that would be amazing and consider yourself welcome. Now take the symptoms of low humidity and think cold temperatures because that's the next one when it comes to the don'ts of Tolumnia care. Because the same symptoms that low humidity shows on Tolumnias will manifest themselves if the Tolumnia was exposed to cold temperatures. Same thing, the desiccated tips and a shriveling of all structures to a certain degree will be exactly the same as you will see with cold temperatures. But there is one symptom that can distinguish the low humidity symptom to the cold temperature symptom that you can watch out for, and that is anthocyanin. That comes with cold damage. It increases the anthocyanin. So if you have a telumna that normally is a nicer green and suddenly you're seeing red, check the fact that maybe your temperatures were too low and it has a problem with that and then you need to remove it from that threat of low temperatures and it will recover relatively quickly. The anthocyanin should then be gone within about a week or two. Because the two symptoms are so similar between the low humidity and the leaf tips versus the cold damage, just know that at least you can take the threat away by putting the orchid into a warmer spot. Low humidity is something you're just going to have to accept. The side effect being that your tolumnias that are a little bit more sensitive will have desiccated leaf tips. Now we were just talking about temperatures, so let's continue with that. Because although tolumnias will endure occasional deviations of their preferred temperature range, which is from 15 degrees Celsius to 26, even 29 degrees Celsius, any extreme lower than 10 degrees Celsius and highs above 32 degrees for any length of time should be avoided. At least it's a little bit forgiving if we make a mistake for one or two nights, if we're not home, if we get home late, if our orchids are still outside. Or for example, if the greenhouse heating didn't kick in and the temperatures dropped that low, there is a little bit of a margin of error that we have to our advantage when it comes to low temperatures. But that should not be interpreted as in, oh, it's okay, I can leave my tolumnia out, it's gonna be 12 degrees for the next couple of days, and well, I'll bring them in when it drops to 10. No, 15 degrees is the absolute minimum, their comfort zone. Breach that and go any lower and you will see signs of desiccated leaf tips and an increase in anthocyanin. Of course, then, being high light orchids doesn't mean that our telumnias should be in direct sun. Even though I have them in direct sun right now, that is only for filming. Even the winter sun, they should not be exposed to direct sun for any length of time either. Of course, you can say I have plenty of airflow, but the structures are so thin, they will burn easily, and you will notice that as well on the leaf tips. I do not expose my telumnias to direct sun no matter what time of year it is, of course, especially not during the summer. The structures of a telumnia are so thin, even though they feel succulent-like, but they don't have a thick cuticle. So the transpiration is pretty fast. With the wet-dry cycle that most of our telumnias are grown in, any kind of water that they've absorbed after being watered will then get lost very, very quickly through the leaves, seeing as their cuticle is so thin. Add to that sun and you've got yourself a big problem. The telumnia is just going to desiccate as a whole, dry up, and that's it. And I just want to point out that indoor growing is not exempt from what I've just said about direct sun. You will know very quickly if your telumnia has had too much sun exposure because first of all, it'll increase exponentially the amount of anthocyanin that you're going to see. Redness is going to come very, very quickly and eventually you will see leaf tips burn and die back. The whole leaf may not die back if you have removed the orchid from the threat of direct sun, but that is going to stay with the orchid for the rest of the lifespan of the fan. At least the appearance of anthocyanin in all the cases, be it being exposed to too cold temperatures or too much direct sun, at least it is a very quick turnaround effect to when we see anthocyanin, which gives us the opportunity to remove it from the threat. The orchid will be fine, 
And that is why Direct Sun for me kind of ranks lowest in the don'ts of the Tolumnia Orchid Care because yes, we've done damage to some structures, but the orchid will recover relatively quickly as opposed to the similar symptoms when it comes to scale. Now, if you have Tolumnias in your collection and you have other symptoms that are a don't when it comes to Tolumnia care, that I haven't included in this video because I'm speaking from my experience based on my environment and the two different kinds of setups I'm growing my telumnias in, then add those into the comments because, you know, people like to go to the comments for more information. And I can only speak for my environment and what I've experienced in the past. My worst threat being scale and what I did wrong over fertilizing. Other than that, the Tolumnias might look a little scruffy, but they bloom. <laughs> I appreciate your time. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so very, very much for watching. Have yourself a fabulous day on one condition, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.